Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us again uh, today. I will give you, first of all, the usual uh, daily statistics report. Uh, 1,480 cases uh, were reported yesterday as positive. That represents 6.9 of the total number of tests carried out yesterday, and the total number of confirmed cases is now 169,699. Uh, today's new cases, uh, 427 of them were in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, 273 in Lanarkshire, 166 in Lothian. The remaining cases were spread across uh, the 11 other health board areas. I can also tell you that by 8.30 this morning, 358,454 people had received their first dose of the vaccine. In addition, I can report today that 2,053 people are currently in hospital. That is 49 more than yesterday and 161 people are in intensive care. That figure is unchanged from yesterday. I'm also extremely sorry to report that 71 additional deaths were registered over the past 24 hours, uh, these of patients who had first tested positive in the previous 28-day period. And that means the total number of deaths under the daily measurement is now 5,628. And as it always is, uh, that figure is a really sharp uh, reminder of just how devastating this virus can be for uh, some of those who get it and, of course, for the families affected and I want again today to say to every family who is in this position that our thoughts are very much with you. Now I'm joined today by the Chief Nursing Officer uh, who of course will help me to answer questions shortly. Uh, before that though there are three issues I want to cover. Uh, the first is about some extra support that we're providing to our health and social care workforce. Throughout the pandemic I think everybody would agree with this our health and care workers have done a truly outstanding job in the most difficult and stressful of circumstances that it is possible to imagine. And of course, uh, the stress that they face, the pressure they face, uh, can be seen in the figures that I'm reporting every day right now. It is severe and it is acute. Uh, and I'm hugely grateful to each and every one of them. And I'm very confident that I say that on behalf of literally every person across the country. Uh, we have done what we can to support the well-being of health and social care staff as they have carried out their work. Uh, in May, you might recall, we launched a national well-being hub, which is there to provide online support for health and care workers and their families. We've also established a 24-7 well-being helpline, again dedicated to health and care staff. Today, I'm announcing a further measure, which will give staff, I hope, a little bit extra practical support. We're allocating an additional uh, half a million pounds to health boards and health and social care partnerships. Uh, that money will be available to help address issues which have been raised directly by health and social care workers. For example, some of it could be used to help provide workers with free hot drinks and snacks when they're on shift. And I know that probably sounds like quite a small thing, and in some ways it is, but it has been flagged up to us as being important in helping workers to rest and recover during the break times that they get uh, during shifts. And of course, sometimes in all walks of life, it can be the little things that help quite a lot. So uh, I'm flagging this up today just as a way of underlining how much we owe our health and care workers, but also as an example of what we're trying to do to support them in practical ways while they continue to perform such an incredible service for all of us. I don't think we will ever be able to repay those uh, on the front line of health and social care for everything they have done and everything they have suffered uh, over the duration of this pandemic. But in every way we can, it's important to support them and to show our gratitude. The second issue I want to uh, refer to in part relates to the economic impact of COVID. Many families right now are struggling to make ends meet uh, because of disruption to jobs. Many will have lost jobs. Um, and this is a difficult time financially and economically for many. Uh, what we know is that that difficulty that people will have been facing is increasing and the further uh, measures during this lockdown will have increased that further. So today I want to highlight an additional source of support that will soon be available to many parents and carers. It's something that was planned before the pandemic, so it's not 
as a result of the pandemic, but I think the importance of it is even greater given what everybody is living through right now. And of course, I'm referring to the new Scottish Child Payment. Uh, the Scottish Child Payment is designed to help families who are struggling financially, those on the, the lowest incomes. You're eligible for it if you receive certain tax credits and benefits, and it will be worth an additional £40 every four weeks. Uh, initially, it's payable for every child under the age of six. In the fullness of time, we will roll it out uh, to all children, but in the initial stages, it's available for children under six. To date, uh, since applications opened, we've received 63,000 applications for the new payment. Uh, and the reason I'm flagging it up today is to hopefully uh, reach anybody who might be eligible who hasn't yet applied. Because if you apply in good time, you can ensure that your payments are calculated from the start date, which is the 15th of February. So if you want to find out more, uh, perhaps you want to check if you might be eligible or if you already know you're eligible and want to apply because you haven't already done so, you can go to the website mygov.scot forward slash benefits or you can call uh, this number 0800 182 2222. That's 0800 182 2222. Uh, we believe that the Scottish Child Payment will be a game changer in the fight against child poverty. That's something that uh, campaigners against child poverty have also said. Uh, and in the coming weeks, we hope it will help provide families who've been hardest hit by the pandemic with some much needed extra financial support. Now, the final issue I want to cover today uh, is in relation to one of the very few settings where people right now will inevitably still be coming into contact with each other. And of course, that's food retail premises, supermarkets, for example. Throughout the pandemic, food retailers and food retail staff have gone to great lengths to keep their shelves stocked and to keep customers as safe as possible. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of them and, and indeed everyone working in our food industry for helping to keep the country going. It is much appreciated. But I know those who work in supermarkets and other uh, essential retail outlets are having to go to work every day. It's not an easy time for you. Uh, so if you're one of them or if you uh, know somebody who is in that category, then please convey uh, my thanks to them. Uh, shopping for food is right now one of the few reasons why we should be leaving our homes uh, right now. But it is important to remember that just like any other reason that we leave home, it's not risk free. Uh, the new variant, as we know, is spreading uh, faster and more easily. So it's all the more important that when we do go to a shop right now, as is essential, we do take the necessary precautions and we are really rigorous in taking those precautions. So I want to just take a moment today to set out some of the key points that will help all of us to stay safe when we're shopping. And many of these points, people send in emails to me if they perceive that these things are not always uh, being followed when they are out shopping. So it's a moment just to remind people uh, of all the things that uh, you should be doing to keep yourself and others safe if you're going to a supermarket, a butcher's, a baker shop, or even uh, just your local corner shop. Firstly, try to limit the number of times that you go shopping right now. Uh, so if you, in normal times, went shopping two or three times a week, see if you can limit that to just once a week right now. Uh, where possible, order online. If you do go to a shop and it's busy, don't go in. Try somewhere else or decide to go back at a less busy time. Shop alone if you can. Uh, that's a really important piece of advice. Uh, don't go with other people. If that's not possible, if you need help to do your shopping, then try to make sure that you keep the group you're with as small as possible. Uh, bear in mind that some retailers are now actually promoting a one shop or one trolley policy in order to reduce the time spent in shops. Sanitise your hands when you're going in and leaving a supermarket. Most supermarket premises will have sanitising stations at entrances, checkouts and exits. Remember to maintain two metres distance at all times. I know how difficult that is, particularly when you're trying to get uh, your shopping from the shelves. But if there are people standing in front of you, 
um, or in front of items that you want, don't lean over them to try to reach those items. And when you're queuing, just try to remember to keep two metres distance from the person in front of you or the person who might be behind you. And be patient if you have to wait a bit longer. Show consideration for shop staff and for other customers. And at all times, follow the facts guidance. That includes, of course, wearing a face covering. Unless you're exempt for a specific reason, face coverings must be worn in all food retail premises. And remember, your face covering should be over your mouth and your nose. That's really vital to make sure it's giving you the protection that it's designed to do, but also that it's giving the people around you maximum protection as well. All of these rules and guidelines are really difficult to follow. Uh, they are a, a real pain in the neck for everybody, but they are really, really important. So I would urge everybody to follow them. Uh, if we do so, we can make shopping a safer experience and help our food retailers as they carry out their essential work. And it is another way that we can all act to keep each other safe. I, I think everybody uh, is trying really hard right now. The vast majority of people are trying really hard and the vast majority of people are abiding by all of the rules and regulations. And I can't ever tell you how grateful I am to everybody for that. But I think all of us know that we just occasionally need to remind ourselves when we're out and about doing essential things of the things that help to keep us safe. And given that food shopping is one of the reasons why many of us may be the only reason why some people are out of their house just now, it's an area where we need to be particularly careful. Uh, those are the main issues I wanted to cover today. Before I close, uh, let me just remind everyone uh, that we should all be staying at home as far as possible right now. Uh, only leave home for essential purposes, essential shopping, as I've just been talking about, if you've got caring responsibilities, for exercise and fresh air, if you need to uh, do work that can't be done at home. Uh, if you are meeting up with others outdoors, that should only be with one other person from another household. So if you're mixing households, it should be no more than two people uh, in any uh, mixed household group. Uh, work from home as you can, as I've said, and remember uh, the facts advice. Face coverings, avoid places that are busy, clean your hands and surfaces, use two metres distancing and self-isolate and get tested if you have symptoms. Uh, all of these things are important for any occasions when we need to be out right now, but the most important thing all of us can try to do as much as possible is stay at home. So I'll leave you with that uh, overarching advice that we're giving everybody right now. Stay at home uh, to protect the NHS and save lives. My uh, grateful thanks to all of you for doing exactly that. Now, I'm going to move straight to questions uh, today. And uh, Fiona, uh, of course, Chief Nursing Officer, is with me and will help me answer the questions. But first up today is Louise Scott from STV. Thank you, First Minister. We've been speaking to care home staff today who say that despite the rapid rollout of the first dose of the vaccine and having been vaccinated themselves, they still feel like they're under siege from the virus and want the second dose as soon as possible. So when is that second dose coming to those care homes? And can you also explain why infections are so high in care homes at the moment? I know the Chief Nursing Officer will want to say a word or two about this as well. Um, we, as I've set out before, we decided in line with JCVI advice to prioritise in our vaccination programme the uh, first dose of the vaccine to uh, older care home residents and also to staff working in those care homes because that's where we can have the biggest and most immediate impact on the, the toll that this uh, virus is taking in terms of making people very ill and unfortunately taking people's lives because people in uh, care homes, older people in care homes are amongst the most vulnerable uh, in terms of getting ill. I can just give a brief update. This is management information, so it's approximate. We obviously publish official statistics on a weekly basis. Uh, but so far, uh, around 95% of residents in older adult care homes have had the first dose of the vaccine and uh, around 77%, uh, just short of 80% of staff in older adult care homes have now had uh, the first dose of vaccine. So that's uh, good progress um, and it's important that that is the case. We are following advice now uh, that says we should uh, prioritise getting as many people as possible in these uh, most vulnerable groups the first dose of the vaccine as soon as possible, with the second dose uh, being uh, up to 12 weeks after the first dose. So people uh, who have had the first dose, uh, they will get their second dose uh, 
at, at the latest 12 weeks from the first dose. And, and that strategy is following the clinical advice that we have had. Uh, that has come from the GCVI, uh, the MHRA, which is the regulatory authority, and of course has been endorsed by all of the chief medical officers uh, across the UK. Um, and that's the, the plan that we are, are working to. In terms of infections in care homes, and uh, the chief nursing officer, I'm going to hand over to her on this. Um, before I say what I'm going to say here, I don't want anybody to hear this as me in any way minimising the burden of this virus in care homes. Um, as long as there's one care home with one case of this virus, it's one too many. Uh, but we do see both in terms of the numbers of care homes with outbreaks, uh, the numbers of, of people uh, in care homes with the virus and the number of people in care homes dying being lower in this second wave of the virus than was the case in the first wave, but still too high. Uh, why are we still seeing infections? This is a very, very infectious virus. Uh, we know the new variant is more transmissible. Uh, we know that the nature of, of care homes make uh, th those settings, any institutional setting is particularly vulnerable where there are people living um, in the same, uh, the same premise. Uh, and of course, when we have infections in care homes, the, the frail and elderly nature of the people uh, there means that they are, are more vulnerable, which comes back to my starting point. That's why it's been so important to prioritise vaccination in those groups. I'll hand over to Fiona now, uh, who will want to add uh, a few points, no doubt, to what I've just said. Thanks, Minister. <clears throat> and clearly, our, our care home residents are our most vulnerable and, and at highest risk from COVID. And that's why, very, very sadly, we saw such um, a number of, of deaths, over half our deaths in the first wave were from care home residents. That's now down to a third or less. So clearly, our, our care home teams are putting infection prevention control measures in place. But right across the world, when we have a pandemic, the nature of infection within our institutions mirrors and reflects what's happening within society. And that then is why we are continuing to see infections within our care homes. From a vaccination perspective, you need to vaccinate either 20, between 20 and 40 uh, care home residents to save one death. So clearly it was imperative that we vaccinated as many as possible, whilst at the same time then using the vaccine to va vaccinate our other um, health and social care staff. And that's again why our, our care home staff are incredibly important and very, very high up the priority list. And the majority of them have been vaccinated. The first dose does give a substantial protection against COVID-19. Now, it doesn't kick in right away, and there have been some people who have had an infection maybe a day or two or three or four days after they've had the vaccination. It does take about two weeks for the antibodies to start growing, and that then continues uh, on and, and provides further protection. We're beginning to talk about, particularly for our care home residents, how can we make sure their second dose happens? Because we sometimes, um, if there is an outbreak, we're thoughtful about uh, whether we're, we're vaccinating or not. But this morning, I was talking to the nurse directors across Scotland about, in practical terms, how we then move towards scheduling in our second vaccinations for both our, our care home residents, but also our, our, the care home staff as well. And that's going to be important as we move forwards to make sure they do get it well within the 12-week time slot. And that's a balancing act between scheduling the vaccinations for our most vulnerable in terms of the first vaccine to give people a significant protection uh, that means the, the, the illness is less, hospitalisations are very, very negligible, uh, and then giving people that second dose that completely um, gives them the best and final immunity that they need. Thank you, uh, David Henderson from BBC. Thank you very much, First Minister. You mentioned yet again the need for people to stay at home, but 70% of people with COVID symptoms are, are not self-isolating properly, according to SAGE advisors, who say government needs to be offering much more support to people, particularly on low incomes. Do you accept there's a need to go much further uh, than the £500 grants that are currently on offer to some? And wouldn't the extra cost be a pittance compared with the alternative, which is lots of extra infections? Um, I... I take uh, very seriously the need for us to look on an ongoing basis at how we better support people uh, who are being asked to self-isolate. Um, I've read reports in uh, some newspapers this morning that the UK government is considering uh, expanding the £500 payment to uh, everybody who's been asked to self-isolate, not just those in low incomes, which is the, the case right now. I, I don't know whether that's true or not. If it was, I would welcome it because that would then 
uh, I hope, trigger additional funding to the devolved administrations. In a financial sense, we are doing uh, everything we can, although we continue to look at what we can do more, how we can stretch our resources, but we are pretty much doing what we can within the resources that we have available to us. As well as the payment, though, we have, and you've heard me talk about this before, we have with councils and its local authorities who are uh, doing uh, the hard work here. We set up the outreach service uh, so that people who are being asked to self-isolate, particularly those who might need additional help, are getting a, a triage phone call from uh, their local authority to assess whether there is more support that can be provided to help them with the practicality. So this is something we look at uh, regularly on an ongoing basis and we will always be looking for how we can better support people to self-isolate. Um, of course, everybody should be staying at home as much as possible right now. If you have COVID or if you're a close contact of somebody with COVID, that is the, the strictest uh, form of self-isolation. You shouldn't even be going, out, be going out for essential purposes, but the whole population should be staying at home right now as much as is possible. Um, I don't want to overstate this next uh, comment because as I've said uh, on previous occasions this week we we have to be careful not to uh, be complacent because we need to see more data but you know our figures suggest that the lockdown is starting to work uh, we again today uh, this is uh, the f from memory, I'm, I'm, if I'm getting this wrong, I apologise, but from memory, this is the first day in a long time that test positivity has been as low as 6.9%, uh, you know, under 7%. So we are starting to see some cautious grounds for optimism that what we are doing right now collectively is working, but we can't be complacent about that against a virus that is uh, infectious, it's always been infectious, but has learned to transmit uh, more quickly. So we keep all of these things under close review. Paul Smith from Global. Good afternoon, First Minister. Yesterday we heard from the organisers of Glastonbury to confirm the uh, festival will be cancelled again this year. We spoke to bosses at Transmit yesterday. Uh, they say they'll update fans in March as to what's going to happen. And uh, Rewind have been quite open on their social media platforms saying this year's festival will be the best one yet. Uh, do you think it's pointless holding out hope for events like this to go ahead this summer? Or do you think the right thing to do is just cancel them again this year? Well, these are difficult balances for organisations to strike, and um, I, I know that better than, than anybody because we are having to reach these difficult judgments uh, every single day right now. Um, so I'll try to be as balanced in this as I, I can, and, and I say this with huge sympathy for any organisation trying to uh, think ahead and decide whether or not a large-scale event can, can happen in the summer. None of us right now can look ahead and say with certainty what the position will be with the summer. Uh, in the summer, uh, we certainly hope that you know the the combination of uh, a vaccine program that by then will be well uh, underway. All of the JCVI priority groups will have been done with the first dose anyway, and we'll be into vaccinating the rest of the population. So that is a, a positive. You know, we know that summer weather conditions, even in Scotland, make life a bit harder for viruses, uh, so it's another positive. Um, but equally, uh, we are still very much in the grip of a global pandemic, and none of these things in and of themselves are going to necessarily, by the summer of this year, create a back to normal, uh, completely back to normal environment in any uh, walk of life. So I think organisations have to be aware of that. Um, I, I think if I was to stand here right now and be asked, as uh, if I can paraphrase your question, I've just been asked, do I think large-scale events by the summer that we can say with any certainty they'll be able to go ahead? The honest answer to that would be no. I, I can't say that with certainty. I hope, just like everybody else hopes, that by then we'll have restored uh, a lot of normality to life. But you know, we equally have to be realistic and pragmatic. I think it is going to be a little while longer um, and I'm saying that gently, before big scale events, I think, become uh, possible again. Now, I hope that's as quickly as possible, but is it going to be by the summer? I could not say that with any certainty. When I set out the latest review in Parliament this week, I, I did talk openly about, even with the vaccination programme, which is such positive news and does offer the best hope for us to get back to a greater degree of normality, we may be living with some kind of uh, mitigations being necessary for, for quite some time to come. Now, I very much hope that's not the strict lockdown we've got just now for very much longer. 
but we may need to do other things to you know whether that's physical distancing uh, face coverings, travel restrictions, all of these things may be necessary for a, a bit longer. Um, and that's the context in which I think organisations uh, have to, to consider these decisions. So I know it's not easy uh, for anybody, the Scottish Government, as we have sought to do all along, are here to give advice and uh, as much of a, a steer uh, to, to organisations taking tough decisions as we possibly can. Uh, Katrine Bussey from PA. Hello, First Minister. I um, wanted to ask about the Social Renewal Advisory Board, which published its report yesterday. It was, of course, set up by the government to kind of provide a blueprint of how the country can guide its way out of the COVID pandemic and came up with some really interesting recommendations around things like a guaranteed minimum income and a further expansion of free childcare. So I just wondered when we might see a response from the government to those recommendations. And also you mentioned earlier, you'd be delighted if the UK government was to commit to giving 500 pounds to every person diagnosed with COVID-19 saying that that would trigger extra money for the Scottish government via Barnet consequentials. If that happened, would you then commit to doing the same thing and giving everybody diagnosed with this virus £500, or would the funds be used differently? No, if, if that's what the, the money was for, we would we would seek to match that. I, I you know, I, I refer to that because, like many people uh, will have, I read it in the papers this morning, I, I should say, in the interests of uh, of frankness, that I've since read sort of comments from uh, UK government sources uh, suggesting that, that that's not about to happen, and you know I, I know all too well, so I've got some sympathy for them how things can be reported, and I'm not criticising journalists here, incidentally, um, and that, that perhaps are are not exactly uh, what we're planning to do. So we'll see whether that transpires or not. But any extra resources for self isolation. Uh, we would use to support self-isolation. Um, on the Social Renewal Advisory Board, um, I think what they have produced is excellent. Um, you know, there's not much I read these days, uh, work-wise anyway, um, that gives me lots of uh, reasons for, for optimism and cheer. Um, but that did. Uh, it set out a really uplifting blueprint for how we can do what many of us have talked about throughout the last year of making sure we come out of this pandemic with a different outlook and a different uh, sort of sense of purpose about the kind of society we want to have here in Scotland. Um, so I, I would certainly recommend it to anybody who's wanting to feel a bit inspired about what the world might look like when we come out of the crisis we, we are in just now. Uh, the Cabinet on Tuesday this week uh, sort of anticipated the publication of the report uh, and uh, made... Uh, a decision then that we would uh, consider it in fairly early course in detail. Uh, Aileen Campbell is the, the Cabinet Secretary who has lead responsibility with Shelley Ann Summerfield. They will be bringing um, a, a paper to the Cabinet uh, over the next uh, few weeks so that we can consider the recommendations in detail and obviously we will respond then. Uh, I'm not going to, I can't give a date for the response right now. Obviously we are also about to go into the Scottish elections so much of the, the content of the report will be for a new government uh, of whatever shape or colour that emerges from the elections. Uh, but we'll respond uh, as quickly as possible uh, in line with giving a, a report of this weight um, due consideration and, and proper consideration. Uh, Dan Vevers from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, good afternoon to you both. Um, a Scottish Government paper published today on the impact of restrictions on children said that polling showed around four in ten parents have adapted guidance to suit their families' needs, for example, like play dates and allowing kids to meet with friends, um, with the main reason given being their child's mental health. Do you understand and sympathise with parents, even if you can't endorse them bending the rules for this purpose? And secondly, just if I may, uh, the BBC reported today that a special Crown Office unit set up to probe COVID-linked deaths is investigating cases at 474 care homes. Um, Huds and staff are being quizzed by police and care homes say the investigation is, is disproportionate and placing a huge burden on workers. You know, ministers have ultimate responsibility for the safety of, of citizens and it was government policy to dis discharge positive and untested patients to care homes early on in the pandemic. So have any ministers been questioned by police? And if not, how can it be right that low-paid care staff are being grilled by police but ministers aren't? 
Uh, Dan, I'm sure I should be the first to uh, recognise, if I was to comment on an independent Crown Office investigation, uh, the Sun rightly would be all over me for trampling over the independence of the Crown Office. Uh, there is rightly a separation of powers between ministers and uh, the Crown Office in terms of uh, investigations into anything that could or uh, might not ultimately, but could uh, involve criminal prosecution. So I'm not going to comment on that uh, in any way. Um, in response to uh, your first question, I have huge sympathy for everybody who's struggling with this pandemic right now. I'm, I'm not a parent, but I'm uh, the anti, uh, the, the very proud anti of uh, a niece and nephews, young people, they're teenagers now, in fact, one of them's older than that, but two in particular who are at the younger end of the, the, the teenage, certainly still of school age. And, and I see with them the, the impact that this pandemic is having, not being at school, not seeing friends. And it's heartbreaking. If, if you know, every aspect of this pandemic is horrible, uh, there is nothing about it that is not horrible. But I, I think if I was to single something out that breaks my heart, and I know has the same effect on everybody, it's the impact on young people. So I've got, you know, more sympathy than I can ever manage to articulate for young people themselves and for parents who are struggling with homeschooling, trying to support the well-being and the mental health of their children and striking the right balance. This is horrendous for everybody, um, but it's necessary. And that's what I ha have to stand here and say. That's my duty is to point out to people the risks of this virus and therefore the reasons why these horrendous restrictions are so important and not just important to have in place, but important for everybody to abide by. The, the more we all abide by them, and I think the vast majority are, despite the difficulties of it all, the more we abide by them, the sooner we get this virus back under control again, uh, while the vaccination programme is doing its work, then the sooner we can have greater normality for our young people. The final point I would make, Fiona may want to say a word here about mental health impact of all of this. Um, the final word I would say, and I've said this before in the context of schools, I think as a society, when we talk about getting back to greater normality, and as we know from the, the, the experience of coming out of the first wave of this, that means choices. When you can't have 100% normality, you have to choose the things that you get back to normal on uh, most quickly. And I think as a society, we and government certainly is of this view, as a society, we should resolve that we give priority to our young people getting back to greatest normality first. And that means schools getting back as quickly as possible, even if that means the adults have to make sacrifices for longer, like not getting to go to the pub or out for dinner or doing the things many of us enjoy doing. If that's what we have to continue to carry in order to allow young people to get back to school, back to seeing their friends, then that, I think, is what we should do. Um, and that's very much uh, the, the principle that will guide us as we start to come out of this lockdown. Do you want to join us anymore? Yes, thanks, First Minister. And obviously, as, as, this, as we move through this pandemic, we learn more about it and more about its impact on, on our citizens. And we, we have about 10 months worth of data now on the negative impact that has had on children and young people. And that's why £15 million was announced in terms of dis to be distributed, distributed to local authorities around mental health and well-being for 5 to 24 year olds in the community. And that is in direct response to what's happening with the pandemic. Further £15 million will be provided in April. And, and that will be based on play, art-based therapies, digital and text-based services and enhanced support for young people and, and families uh, who are waiting for CAMS. But the bulk of this is not for specialist services. It's just a broad support for, for um, health and well-being for children and young people. And of course, outside play um, is, is important. And as hopefully the, the nights get lighter and the weather gets slightly better, then being able to, to have young children meeting outside and playing is, is clearly going to be important as well. But that's why the additional support has been put in, recognising how important it is to support and um, maintain the, the well-being of, of children and young people right across Scotland. And of course, welcoming um, the resumption of schools when it is safe to do so. And again, we have more information now about how the new variant transmits across the different age ranges and we'll be able to take that into account in our decision making. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Mail. 
Hello, good afternoon. Um, some figures that are around in recent days show uh, that Scotland is lagging behind other parts of the UK in relation to uh, getting the first dose out to over 80s. Um, <clears throat> the figure for England is that 56% of over 80s have received the first dose, 44% Northern Ireland, 23% in Wales, um, and Scotland 13%. And I think Wales also took the similar approach of uh, targeting care homes first. Um, so are, are these figures a concern? And a, a number of health boards have told me that their community vaccination centres won't be fully up and running in, in, until February. Um, why hasn't that happened quicker? And why weren't they uh, open on uh, January the 11th when the community rollout got going? Uh, the figures you've just quoted to me are a concern, uh, but mainly because they're not accurate. Um, so if you take over 80s, uh, you quoted me a figure of 13%. Um, I'll give the usual caveat that what I'm about to cite is management information, um, and uh, but I can tell you as of 8.30 this morning, 34% uh, of over 80s. Uh, have been uh, vaccinated according to our uh, management information with the, the first dose. 95% uh, of residents in older adult care homes, 77% of staff in older adult care homes and almost 90% of health and social care workers uh, more generally. Um, so we deliberately started in care homes for the reasons we have set out. Uh, so our 95% of uh, residents there, I suspect, is way ahead of other parts of the UK, certainly at the start of this week, and this will have grown since then. So, and I, I'm just giving you this figure because I haven't heard the latest one. Back in uh, on Monday, I think it was when I heard the UK vaccines minister talking about care homes in England, the figure he used was 50%. By then, we were already over 70%. So we have started with care homes because these are the people who are most vulnerable of getting ill and dying. We are pretty much finished that now, and therefore what you see is the over 80s population in the community picking up pace. So the figure I've given you today is, you know, about five percentage points higher than it was yesterday and will continue to grow. We're all working to the same targets. We have set the uh, target of all over 80s uh, have, having been given their first dose by the first week in February, by the 5th uh, of February, um, and we are on track to do that. That's the same uh, target that others are working to. And then, of course, we have set the, the further target of everybody in the over 70 category being done by mid-February. So that's uh, what we are uh, doing uh, right now. And we'll continue to, to pick up pace as the supplies grow. So too will be the, the, the different settings and the scale and the size of the settings that deliver the vaccine. Connor Matchett from The Scotsman. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, just uh, um, kind of lead on from Michael's question about vaccines, there was reports in the Yorkshire Post today, don't know if you saw them, about um, the Yorkshire and Leeds being punished for the speed of their vaccination programme and supply being diverted south. I'm wondering, first of all, whether or not that's happening for Scotland's uh, vaccination programme, whether or not any, any vaccines are being held by uh, the UK government because they need to speed up their programme, and whether or not you would do the same thing as is happening in the UK um, by moving vaccine supplies around if parts of uh, Scotland are lagging behind. And secondly, if I may, um, it's actually coming up to a year since the first COVID incident management team was set up in Scotland, uh, incredibly enough. A lot has happened since then. In your opinion, what do you think you've gotten wrong? And if given the chance, what would you have done differently? Um, on the first part of your question, I, uh, somebody who's the, the granddaughter of somebody who was uh, from the north of England, I, I hesitate to say this, but I, I am not a regular reader of the Yorkshire Post. I perhaps should be a regular reader of the Yorkshire Post. Um, so I haven't seen uh, the story that you're referring to this morning. I'll, I'll go and look at it later on. Um, but I think the answers to your questions on that are, are no and no. Uh, so no, to the best of my knowledge, uh, if the UK government is uh, taking supplies away from the, the, the areas that are further ahead in vaccine to give them to areas that are further behind, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that is not affecting Scotland. And no, we, we will con within Scotland, we'll continue to uh, distribute the vaccine equitably so that we are not having postcode lotteries. And, you know, clearly we have... Uh, challenges that, um, I'm not suggesting nobody has these challenges, but a bigger proportion of our population lives in 
what is classed as remote and rural areas, so there are different challenges around distribution, although some of the figures I've seen, again, from management information would suggest that some of our rural and, and island communities are actually doing very well in terms of getting through these priority groups. But we'll continue to make sure there's an equitable um, allocation of the, the supplies of the vaccine that we have. Um, on, I'm, I'm going to inevitably give you a brief answer here to what is a, a, a very important question and in due course it's the kind of question that I will want to answer at some length probably in different forums and on different occasions. Um, but we've got, so we, we've got things wrong and I've tried never to shy away from this. Uh, some of that will be you know, relatively small things in the grand scheme of things, some of that might be, be bigger. I, if I look back to about a year ago right now, um, and we had our first case uh, the 1st of March, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, but you're right, we were already, you know, planning and thinking about what was coming down the track at us. I think across the UK, and I'm, you know, not by any stretch of the imagination that the first person to have said this, I think um, we in a way that perhaps some Asian countries with uh, experience of SARS in the past uh, didn't, we probably were planning for something akin to a flu pandemic. COVID and coronavirus is very different to flu. And so some of our early decisions may have been influenced by that. Now, I think that has changed and rightly that has changed. Some of what we will have got wrong is, is a judgment with hindsight, you know, because if I knew now, sorry, if I knew then what I knew, know now, there are some things I would have done differently. Perhaps, you know, testing in care homes being one of those. But I didn't know then what I know now. And therefore, if I was to take, turn the clock back with the knowledge we had then, we would do the same things because we were acting on what we knew then. So this is quite, a, it's a really important question. And I think it's one that people like me in decision making positions have a duty to try to understand ourselves and be really open with ourselves and then share so that we can all learn from this. But I think as we do that, I think in fairness to those of us who were plunged into this crisis and have had to take the best decisions we can on a daily basis, I think it's really going to be really important to understand the difference between things that we just got wrong, because there will have been examples of that on the one hand and things on the other hand where Although we, with this uh, perspective that we have a year on, we think we did things wrong, it w they weren't wrong at the time because they were based on the information we had at the time. And, and understanding the difference between these two things is going to be part of that whole process. But I final point in this, because I said I was going to give a short answer and I've just gone on for probably much longer than I should. But this, this is something that's really important to me. Um, I, I want to make sure we learn properly from this. I... I hope that our generation will never, ever have to go through a global pandemic again. Um, but sooner or later, some generation will. And therefore, it's really important that we learn lessons now so that we are leaving those for the benefit of those who come after us, but also so that there can be proper scrutiny and accountability so that we're all taking part in, in that. So it's, it's something that I feel very strongly about, as I hope... Uh, it's coming across, even if I'm not being as uh, coherent as I will be when I've had the proper time to, to think about this in full. Because that's the other thing, and this is my final point. Right now, we're still in a crisis. So much as it's important that we look back and we analyse and we think, what did we get right and what we got wrong? The most important thing I've got to do and lead a whole government to do is focus on the here and now and tomorrow uh, rather than yesterday because I can't change what happened yesterday, I can still influence what happens tomorrow, and therefore I can't lose that focus, and I can't allow my government to lose the focus on the remaining phases of this pandemic. I'm not sure I gave you any headlines there, Connor. Um, my apologies, but um, Dan Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thanks very much, First Minister. Um, we keep hearing from you and your colleagues that the vaccination programme is, is ramping up, but the, the sort of increase in today's figure is about 1,400 less than it was yesterday. The figure that was, or the increase that was announced yesterday was lower than the increase that was announced on Wednesday. So why is that? You know, why, why on your own figures does the, this, this seem to be slowing down rather than actually speeding up? Um, you know, I hear what you're saying on, on care homes, but we've been told around 600,000 doses have been delivered. Um, GPs are apparently raring to go. So 
you know, why can't you do the care homes and also speed up uh, vaccinations in the community? Um, and also just um, last Monday's figures, we saw a bit of a drop in over the weekends. And we only got three days, but the sort of average daily figure had gone down. Um, what, what's, what's the situation going to be this weekend? Could we expect another drop or have, have measures been put in place to make sure there's still be a, a sort of seven-day option? Thanks. Sorry, I couldn't hear the, the remainder of that question because your, uh, your line broke up. Uh, we'll be operating on a seven-day. I think we're going to be publishing figures uh, from this weekend, if not from this weekend, from next weekend, in case I'm getting that wrong. Uh, we've only been publishing the daily figure on weekdays. We're going to move to a seven-day publication, so we will see uh, that on a daily basis. Look, the overall figure just now will take account of the fact that we are still, although we are almost finished care homes, we're still doing some care home uh, vaccination, which takes longer and is more labour intensive. But if you look at the uh, the over 80s in the community, we are seeing that speed up. So, you know, we've gone from in one day, five percentage point increase. So, you know, it's the cohorts within the overall figure uh, that we are looking at as well as the, 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 the global figure. And the over 80s vaccination programme by that I mean in the community, not over 80s in care homes, is picking up pace and will gather pace uh, as we go through next week and towards that target date of the, the 5th of February. Do you want to add anything? I think uh, what we have in Scotland is a lot of our GP practices, and I understand when people are, are, are talking about um, supply and the response by our whole system to people coming forward to vaccinate, GPs desperate to vaccinate their, their patients, has been amazing and the the resilience of our staff in the NHS is, is quite remarkable so keen such enthusiasm to do the vaccinations and I know that GPs have been taking their time to think through their patient list how they're going to do it so I, I, I've been speaking to a number of people and I know that some GP surgeries this weekend for instance they're doing the routine work during the week will bring in all of their over 80s and, and vaccinate them so I think it's about planning it's about organising it's about having confidence in the scheduling so like anything that's starting off and starting up, uh, making sure that we've got the right distribution, the, the, the right way of doing things, the, the, whether it's GPs or, or the bigger areas, that we're, it is easy then to get a, a lot of numbers through. Uh, these are coming on stream, it's important that we plan and organise and it's important that we also give people notice and time to get there for the vaccination so that they can be well supported if they need to be taken there, particularly in the older age group. But I'm absolutely confident that the systems are going to be in place and that the staff are hugely dedicated to making sure that as many of our population are protected as we possibly can. Alistair Grant from The Herald. Uh, hi, First Minister. Thanks very much. It's been reported today that painting or repair work took place at your official Butte House residence in Edinburgh this month. Uh, are you confident that work fully followed lockdown rules, or was it, as some of your political rivals have suggested, uh, a slap in the face to those who are following the rules on work taking place inside homes? Uh, can I just follow on from a question that was asked earlier about festivals and kind of live events this summer? Uh, would you simply advise organisers to, to cancel those events, given the logistical planning that goes into them? And many musicians, artists and performers heavily rely on events like those for income and will be absolutely devastated if they can't go ahead. Will further help or a rescue package be made available if, uh, if festivals or big live events can't go ahead this year? Uh, are those conversations taking place? Thanks. I'm not going to go beyond what I said uh, earlier on on live events. Uh, we will, of course, continue to talk to individual organisers of events and give the best advice we can. Um, and yes, we will, of course, continue uh, in the overall uh, support we give to people who are affected in their business or working life uh, to think about the, the impact on uh, musicians, live performers who have been particularly hard hit by this. And that certainly will be uh, an issue of uh, very active consideration as the position as we go towards the summer becomes uh, clearer. Um, on the Butte House thing, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to uh, address this today uh, because uh, the story that appeared on the front page of a paper this morning is, is not accurate, uh, certainly the impression that it was giving is not accurate and the reason it's important to address it is because I know and understand that nothing infuriates people right now more than the sense that there's one law for uh, everybody and somehow another law for people like me and that is not true. So I think there's um, 
a couple of points just to, to make uh, to clarify the, the Butte House issue. Firstly, I'm not staying in Butte House just now. Um, I haven't set foot in Butte House since uh, the first lockdown because back then I decided uh, to, to minimise the number of staff that were having to be in Butte House to cut my own contacts as much as possible. I was going to stay in my own home um, and that's what I've been doing since the first lockdown. So I haven't been in Butte House. It's not being used right now as a residence. So it's not a home uh, as it was uh, described this morning. Secondly, the work, there has been work carried out in January, but it was essential safety work, uh, as I understand, and the explanation I'm about to give here is probably not a, a technical one, but it's been to pin uh, part of a ceiling or the plaster work of a ceiling that was deemed essential because it was uh, the state it was in was unsafe. Um, and I think there was some security work uh, done at the same time. There has been no painting and decorating done, and that was the... Uh, the suggestion in the newspaper this morning. Uh, it was essential work for safety reasons, not painting and decorating. Um, so just to be very clear here, the rules that we are living under right now apply to me uh, and my ministers and government officials just as they apply to everybody else. Um, I have to be in here as essential work because I'm leading the country's uh, pandemic response. I have to do this briefing every day, but when I'm not required to be at essential work, um, either here or when I'm required uh, as part of my duties to be answering questions in Parliament, I'm at home, staying at home, like I'm asking everybody else to do. So that's the situation uh, there. And as I say, I think it is important to address these things because nothing... You know, I did have the laps before Christmas when I was at a funeral and I briefly took off my, my face covering. And, and I, you know, th the reason... Uh, I address that then as well, is because it's really important. I'm not exempt from these rules, and nor should I be. And I know people get really angry, understandably so, if they do get the suggestion that somehow I've got special dispensation. I really don't have, and nor should I have. Uh, Paul Hutchin from the Daily Record, uh, which is where the story appeared this morning. Yeah, I think many of the points have already been covered on vaccination and uh, care homes. Um, First Minister, you said earlier this month that you saw um, no reason yet for why the Scottish Parliament election uh, should be delayed. Um, given where infection levels are at, can you just say at what point the presiding officer and all the other political parties will have to make a decision uh, on whether May's election will go ahead at that point? Um, I I'm not sure I can give you off the top of my head a, a specific date for that. I'm not sure if Parliament is working to some kind of uh, assumption. I'll, I'll check that and get back to you on that point of detail. Um, my view really hasn't changed since you last asked me this. Um, I, I think, and I, I might not be getting this figure 100% right here, but I think over the course of this pandemic, something like 70 countries across the world have held elections. Um, so elections can be held even in a global pandemic. And my view is if at all possible, the election should go ahead. It's, it's a crucial part of our democracy that people get the opportunity to decide after five years, and this parliamentary term has been a five-year one, whether this government should continue or another government should, should take over. And perhaps at a time of crisis, that is even more important. Um, it may be that there have to be changes made to how the election is conducted, more postal voting, for example, and of course we have contingency legislation that was passed just at the turn of the year to, to make some of those options available. And the second point would be, which goes to your question, Paul, is that this would have to be, if there was any change made to the election, either to the timing of the election or the rules about the conduct of the election, it's really, really important that those are not decisions for the government of the day alone. It would be a cross-party decision and uh, one that the legislation makes clear involves the presiding officer as well. Now, as with every other aspect of life right now, these things have to be kept under review. Uh, but my view right now is that there is no reason why the election can't go ahead, albeit there may have to be some changes to, to how it is conducted. But in terms of uh, whether there are specific cut-off dates where these decisions have to be made, if you let me check that, I'll try and get back to you on that if there, there are any such dates. Uh, David McPhee from the PNJ is the last question. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, new Police Scotland figures uh, show officers are still having to disperse hundreds of people in groups across the North East and the Highlands since the announcement of uh, stricter COVID measures. Why isn't, why isn't the message about staying home getting through to some and what 
and what can be done to make people comply with the rules, especially given the threat posed by the new variant. Uh, thanks, David. Firstly, I'll ask Fiona to say a word or two about the importance of the stay-at-home message, just to give this as the last question to end on that point. Firstly, I think it's important not to take the actions of the minority and use them to sort of uh, obscure the compliance of the majority. The majority are complying with these rules, and you know I know how difficult that is. So I think it's really important to say how grateful I and we are for that and how important it is that that continues to be the case. Uh, yes, there's a minority, it has been the case all, of, all along, that haven't complied with one or more of the, the restrictions in place. Why is that? You know, I, I guess there'll be a variety of reasons. With some people, and I know the police will, would say this, that when they challenge some people, they will find it is maybe just a misunderstanding of what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do and when it's pointed out to them that they're breaching the rules they're quite happy to to rectify their behavior with some you know if there'll be people who maybe just wake up one morning and think I can't you know I can't stand this being at home any longer I'm just going to go out and please don't do that although I understand why you will feel like that but there'll be a small minority as in any uh, situation that just decide that the rules don't apply to them and they're going to flout them. There'll be some who think that people like me are making up this global pandemic. It's all a way of controlling people. Um, and to that small group, because I think it is a really small group, but your actions can have big consequences right now because you are putting yourselves and others at risk. Uh, and my message there is don't be selfish. Don't and don't fall for all the conspiracy rubbish about how this is all made up. You know, any ICU doctor or nurse right now, any family that's lost somebody to COVID will tell you from their own experience that this is all too real and all too dangerous. So don't fall for that nonsense and don't act selfishly. Um, this, with a virus, unlike many other things, we are so dependent on each other. You know, this analogy has been used before, but it's worth using it again, if, if you're somebody that, that likes to take part in extreme sport that is really dangerous, every time you do it, you put your life at risk, then you're doing that knowing that if it goes wrong, it's your life that is at risk. And, you know, people can make their own judgments about whether you're sensible or not. But right now, if you decide to be reckless, if you decide that you don't care about these rules and you're going to go and mingle with your pals and not uh, comply with any of the, the mitigations, yes, you are putting yourself at risk, but as soon as you go home or go somewhere else, you're putting everybody you come into contact with at risk as well. And and that that is selfish for if anybody is behaving in that way right now. So so please don't do it. But let me end on the positive. I think the vast majority of people are complying. And, you know, I want to say thank you for that. Uh, this is not over. We have to comply for a bit longer yet, and it gets harder with every day that passes, but know that you, in complying, are making a difference, and it is not an exaggeration for me to say you are saving people's lives. So thank you for it. Fiona. Um, absolutely. And I think, it, again, it's important to remember the virus relies on us and human behaviour to to be transmitted. So we we have the power to, to stop that transmission and by staying at home and reducing the people we mix with absolutely reduces transmission. And we can see that as numbers are gradually decreasing. The new variant, because of course the virus constantly tries to renew itself to, to keep alive and, and to keep moving. So the new variant does pass on much more quickly. And I've spoken to a number of people who have had COVID and they genuinely believe that they were following the rules and they unfortunately became infected. So therefore those who don't follow the rules are much greater risk of being infected. Talking to clinicians, um, as I have done this week, uh, we have younger people, people in their 30s who are in intensive care units. We have hospital staff who are, are just outstanding. They, they are weary. Um, they're, they're, they're facing death quite constantly, especially in intensive care. But they are so committed to continuing to provide a good service to people. And not only that, committed to remind people that if you have other non-COVID health-related conditions, you need to uh, you know, phone your GP, phone NHS 24, or, or go to the hospital. But we also see, um, as we have seen this, this week in, in a small island community, just how quickly this new variant moves and transfers. So it's incredibly important, as we are seeing vaccinations um, coming into play, 
The real risk is if we don't get transmission down and we don't manage to control the virus, then even more mutations will happen. And at the moment, we have a confidence around the vaccine responding to the mutations and still being effective. But probably now more than ever, it's incredibly important for us all to follow the rules, be thoughtful and careful uh, about just precisely what we do and then we will see continued progress, continued improvement. And I think most importantly, and as the First Minister said, it, you just need to listen to the people. And I saw this week a gentleman whose wife had just passed away minutes before. And it's impossible for your heart not to go out to, to, to people who never thought it would happen to them. So that's, I think, where we all have to remember you know, the real commitment of our health uh, and social care staff in, in caring for us, the heartbreak of families who've lost loved ones. And a bit of self-discipline, a, a bit of control, and, and finding ways to make these rules and regulations possible within our own lives will mean that we will gradually see this virus reduce and get out of the pandemic safely and well. Thanks, Fiona. And I think that's a, an appropriate place to end. Uh, the point Fiona made there uh, about nobody being able to guarantee they won't get this virus or pass this virus on is a really important one. Even if you comply 100% with these rules, uh, there's always a risk with an infectious virus. But think about it in terms of every time you, you breach one of these rules, you increase the risk. Conversely, the more you stick with these rules, the more you are lowering your risk of getting the virus and of passing it on to people that, that you love. So please, please stay at home. Uh, I know I'm always conscious on a Friday that this is a it's not an easy message to give people any day, but it always feels a bit harder to give it on a Friday when we're going into a weekend and people would normally be thinking about doing the things that we enjoy doing at weekends, seeing family or friends or, or going places that we don't always go during the week. Uh, so it's tough. It really is tough for people uh, right now. But staying at home is the best thing we can do to avoid getting this virus and avoid passing it on. It is literally... What we need to do to protect the NHS, who are working so incredibly hard and deserve not just the gratitude, but the help of each and every one of us right now. And if we do all of that, we do save lives. We reduce the number of people who, for the remainder of this pandemic, will sadly lose their lives. So please uh, continue to, to abide by all of this. And if you're one of the minority who hasn't been, uh, who thinks it's all nonsense and there's no need to do that, please think again. Please take a long, hard uh, look at what you're doing and a long, hard think uh, about what you're doing and make sure you're acting in a way that keeps yourself and others safe. So thank you to everybody for joining us today. Um, I'll be back on Monday here for uh, the latest briefing. And in the meantime, uh, have as good a weekend as you can, but please stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. Uh, my thanks to Anna as well today for our BSL interpretation. Thank you all very much.